Stay tuned for tonight's adventure with the Fat Man. Okay, here we go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time of day it is, I hope it's good to be where you are because I'm really excited to be here today. My name is Baltimore Fats, and this is the continuation of the Norse Code. Yeah! All right. So I'm calling this one The Dots and Dashes, and it's also the last one that I recorded before Queen Elizabeth died. So after this one, it's going to be Chucky the Third going forward. Okay. All right, guys. Have fun. And so to quickly recap, Dora's trip to St. Tollins led me to Sir Bevel Granville, who led me to Rollo, first Duke of Normandy, who led to Sterla Ellingvag, which ultimately led to this study here, Population Genomics of the Viking World. Right? And this is a study that the mainstream media and academia have run with, you know, changing our historical narrative by letting us know that it's time to say goodbye to the Viking. And I'm sure it's just a coincidence that they injected this study into the narrative right at the height of the pandemic's hysteria on September 16th, 2020. And I don't know what it is, but coming at this story from the angle that I came in at it, you know, this genetically certifying the royal family angle, something just doesn't feel right about this story, right? Because they went from Viking is forefather to the British royals to there being no such thing as Vikings in 11 years. I mean, this is... 2020, this is 2022, right? And this is 2011, you know, both in June. It's hard to get closer than exactly 11 years. And so I guess it takes 11 years to change history. But why, you know, why did they need to get rid of the Vikings? Is it possible that Sterla and his team of researchers discovered something in their work that facilitated this change? You know, perhaps they found something that changes what we know about the royal family and where they could be from, and they're just not hipping us to that? You know, I don't know. But my fat senses are telling me there's something there, right? Because, because not only could Vikings never existing affect the royal family in the story of the Normans, it has a direct impact on today's identity politics. Because as briefly mentioned, the modern interpretation of what a Viking was, it's a construct that has more than a hint of racist essentialism in it, right? And it's, and it's high time that historians, both academic and popular, ditched the Vikings as an outmoded and dangerous way of thinking. The Vikings never existed. It is time to put this unhealthy fantasy to bed. And there's just something about this article and some of the others that we're going to look at and the way that they present this racial context to the Vikings and how it's been co-opted by certain groups. Because as I said, the aim of this paper and all the articles published thereafter is to show that Vikings weren't a blonde-haired or blue-eyed people, right? like this guy. And the fact that being a Viking was merely a job description, right? as this science.org article tells us. And so understanding the part that identity politics plays in the story of Mud City, I naturally filtered this idea through the prism of identity politics, because, because what eliminating the idea of a Scandinavian race of Vikings does is it kneecaps these people, right? Now, I mean, these people, right? Because whether it was intentional or not, right? And the timing of a story like this one, just a few months before an election that can, that can swing the U.S. government to the alleged party of choice of these idiots, you know, the, the timing is just too fortuitous, right? It's just perfect timing. Because if, and that's a big if, identity politics is a construct of the powers that be and merely a tool for social control, and you've created all these delicate fractals of the human race, then you need some common focus to keep them galvanized. What you need is a villain, a bad guy, you know, the yin to this yang. And what greater villain has history ever known than these guys? I mean, these guys. <laughs> and who were these guys really but these people, right? And just about every bad thing that ever happened in history can be blamed on these people, especially if they're Christian, right? And so they're the perfect foil for the fragile fractals. And the Gnostic Sophian metaphor that can be pulled from this scenario is not lost on me, right? This, the prism effect of a white light fractaling off into these variations, right? And so it's very interesting to see the way that all of this is playing out today because, because I'm certain that those that wrote the identity politics program that's in effect today and I'm using the law firm of Peabody, Hopkins, and Carroll because of how perfectly they represent the mind, body, and soul in this Mud City paradigm. But, you know, this list also includes all your usual suspects, your Morgans, your Rockefellers, your Rothschilds, you know, who have you. You know, they were aware of it, too. To me, it's fascinating to see the way that the program is evolving, because that's what I see happening when I pull the lens back as far as I can. You know, and of course, 
This is the bias of Mud City, you know, that our social present is the progression of an AI or Mandelbrot-esque program that was written in what we think of as the 1800s today, because, because if our timeline is correct, then Mud City posits that these guys knew the long con that they were playing. If our timeline is correct, we cannot underestimate the intelligence of these people, especially 150 to 200 years ago, because ostensibly they would have been a pure human being. Right, their brains and their bodies would be unspoiled by the toxins that they were about to poison the world with. Right? And there's no escape from that today. You know, rainwater almost everywhere on Earth has unsafe levels of forever chemical. And so if this is true, then it's all over for all the living animal species on this realm. Who knows what damage these forever chemicals have done to our bodies and our minds over the generation? There is there just is no baseline. For that comparison right? and so but by judging by the state of our realm today i'm gonna go with that it's significant right because people still think that food can be organic right? in the wake of all of this forever chemicals right and vegans think that plants aren't carnivores right who will gladly eat who will gladly eat any dead animal buried underneath them and sometimes live animals as well right and and then there's all the frequencies that they're bombarding us with. Who knows how badly our brains are functioning under this constant barrage of technology. And so if our timeline is correct, 150, 200 years ago, human beings would have been operating at a much higher capacity, a greater efficiency. And this isn't to say that they couldn't be using these frequencies to to the mind for higher functioning, but I don't think they're sharing that technology with us. And so if intelligent people today can program immersive, interactive games like Grand Theft Auto and The Sims, and not to mention the other types of simulation programs that are out there. Who knows what these people could have been capable of? And that's what Mud City is all about. Using what the gatekeepers give us and exploring these possibilities. And for whatever reason, this paper and the controversy surrounding Sterla has really captured my attention because of how it plays the race card and because it's a clear demonstration of how easy it is to change our historical narrative. All you have to do is flood the media. Right? And nothing drives this home more than IGN's pimping of this story. Because when I saw an article come up at the top of my search for that Nature paper, it perplexed me, right? Because, because I know that IGN is primarily a video game and entertainment culture website. And it was the brainchild of media entrepreneur Chris Anderson. And it was launched on September 29th, 1996. You should play around with that date. And media entrepreneur Chris Anderson is also the head of TED Talks. Right? And he was also the founder of Future Publishing. And Future Publishing is a British media company founded in 1985 that publishes more than 50 magazines in the field, such as video games, technology, films, music, photography, home, and then my favorite, knowledge. <laughs> right? And so between this and TED Talks and IGN, Chris Anderson is elbow deep. Right? Because IGN and sources like them are the best way to get this information into the young. Because even Forbes knows that they're just not teaching history anymore. Certainly not like they should. So if you want the impressionable young who have been groomed in an identity politics world to know that the source of the bad guy's powers never existed, then you need to put that information in places that they may see it. You know, places like IGN, who get double bonus points for further blurring the line between history and entertainment while they were at it. Because what does our history become but the backdrop for a movie or a video game? Right? Who knows? Maybe that's all our history was ever intended to be in the first place, right? And, and somebody needs to get Sony on the horn real quick and hit them to the fact that Vikings didn't look like this. <laughs> this is sloppy work, Sony. <laughs> and so it looks like the programmers at Sony need to bone up on their IGN. And to IGN's credit, this article avoids the topic of racism altogether, leaving that for the more scholarly publications, I guess, right? But, but it does offer up some useful information information that may help Sterla's claim of bias by giving details from where some of these samples came from. And so it says that it turns out most Vikings weren't as fair-haired and blue-eyed as legend and pop culture have led people to believe. And it says that nature's study sequencing the genomes of 442 Viking remains from Viking-inhabited areas like Northern Europe Italy and Greenland, human remains dated between 2400 BC and 1600 AD, and which were buried with a variety of Viking artifacts, reveals far more genetic diversity than previously thought about the people who came from the land. And so by mentioning where some of these samples 
came from, IGN has inadvertently given me something to look for when I tear into this nature, that when I tear into this paper, the population genomics on the Viking world, which I have not done yet. And we're going to find out if this paper will answer some of the questions I'm about to raise. Because I have to wonder, right, is it legend and pop culture that led people to believe this? Right? Or is it academia, right? which can also be simulated? Or was it always a simulation in the first place? Yeah, it's absolutely ridiculous. And this is why language is so amazing, because, you know, Viking inhabited areas you know, like Northern Europe, Italy and Greenland, you know, doesn't necessarily mean Viking homeland. And 442 seems like a lot of remains, but spread out over 4,000 years, as this sampling timeline suggests, right? 2400 to 1600 AD, that's 4,000 years. And I just have to note that I think it's interesting that they can find usable DNA from remains 2400 BC, but they couldn't find it in remains from 700 AD in one of the tombs Richard, right? That's interesting. And, you know, so over this 4,000 years with 442 Vikings, that works out to something like one Viking for every 10 years of this history. And again, hopefully we'll see how this plays out. But if most of your samples come from, say, Italy and from 500 years after the Viking era, well then yes, I think there would be less blonde and blue people there, right? But of the 442 remains sampled, this IGN article only gives specifics on a small number of them. And can you guess what that number is? Wait for it. Wait for it. It's 11. <laughs> there, with these two ones they find in Scotland here, who look to be, and this is unbelievable, I love the way they phrase this, right? Two Viking skeletons buried in the Northern Isles of Scotland had what looks to be relatively pure Scottish and Irish heritage with no Scandinavian influence, at least not genetically speaking, that is. What looks to be, what looks to be is not is. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is so passive and doesn't, have uh, authorship or ownership to th to this conclusion, right? It looks to be, you know, it's... I don't know the word, the word I'm looking for, but it's not a definitive. All right, so we have these two, right? And so IGN goes on to say that uh, Science Magazine also highlights several individuals from Norway, right? And we're going to get into all of this down the line, right? So several, that's seven. So now we're at nine, right? And then down here they have two found hundreds of miles apart, one in the UK and one in Denmark who turned out to be a pair of cousins. You know, so that's, you know, seven plus two is nine plus the other two, that's 11. <laughs> 11 out of 442, right? And so let's take a look at a map of the Viking world real quick. You know, the Viking age is said to have lasted from 700 AD to 1100 AD or 400 years, right? So during this 400 year span, historians tell us that the Vikings had influence in this huge portion of the realm. But why would researchers take any sample from 500 years after the Viking Age? What are you looking for after the Viking Age? Because if the majority of your Viking samples come from places far away from Scandinavia, like, say, Turkey, right, or Uzbekistan, and so it stands to reason that you're going to find a more darkly complected DNA profile, right? Because the original Viking settlers or conquerors, however you want to call them, you know, their bloodline would have just been assimilated into the regional culture. And I find all, and I find this interesting because one thing I haven't seen yet in any of the reading I've done is any mention on the origins of the Viking culture. You know, just on how it was a myth. <laughs> because the idea that Vikings weren't just a giant race of blonde-haired, blue-eyed people like this guy has been around since at least the mid-1970s with the publication of Michael Crichton's Eaters of the Dead. Right? And Eaters of the Dead is the story of a Muslim missionary who travels north with a band of Swedish Vikings, right? And it was made into an underrated movie called The 13th Warrior, starring Antonio Banderas. Right? And the title change to 13th Warrior, not only is it less cryptic, but, you know, the, the Swedish band of Vikings was a group of 12, right? And so as the missionary, he was the 13th. And it's impossible to underestimate the importance of Michael Crichton and his impact on the many narratives of today, right? Starting with The Andromeda Strain, which I think was his first novel, or first one published under his own name anyway, right? The way this predates or predicts or <laughs> precurses <laughs> the, the pandemic, right? And then, right, and next on his list is Westworld, you know, how the this could predate, precurse, predict, you know, the simulation culture, that's happening all over the place with video games and interactive things and cosplay and so many, you know, I mean, it's really ridiculous. It's just incredible the way this sort of simulation theory can branch out, you know, in the 
in the Paradigm Puzzle Tree. I haven't used that in a while. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, then, of course, what's next is Jurassic Park. All right, can't forget Jurassic Park. And it's with its DNA-fueled resurrection of extinct species, an idea apparently alive and well in science today as they look to bring back the Tasmanian tiger. Science plans the resurrection of an animal that's been extinct since 1936. Yeah, I love that year. <laughs> the project is a collaboration with Colossal Biosciences. Love that name too, right? Founded by tech entrepreneur and more name magic, right? Ben Lamb and Harvard medical geneticist George Church. Church and Lamb. You know, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> you know, the, the symbolism, the metaphors that can be pulled just from those, just from those last names and this, you know, DNA type research, you know? And they're working, and these guys are also working on an equally ambitious, if not bolder, $15 million project to bring back the woolly mammoth in altered form. <laughs> so I guess I'm not really bringing back the woolly mammoth at all. And this is something that I've been hearing about that like forever. It seems, I think I remember hearing about this even in high school, some 35 years ago or more now that they've been talking about this, you know, certainly that they could collect DNA from the woolly mammoth anyway. And so I'm digressing with all of this. You know, I just also wanted to point out that it's interesting that Michael Crichton lived to the age of 66. You know, I doubt that, you know, is that a coincidence? I mean, I guess it could be. But again, as I was saying, the idea that there's more to the Vikings than race is nothing new, right? But historians want us to know that it's actually been that way the whole time, right? You know, the word Viking seems to have entered the modern English in the early 19th century when medieval Icelandic literature was beginning to be translated into major European languages. And so this Icelandic literature are something called sagas, right? And some of them are known as Eddas today. And so the problem that I have with this is that these sagas were oral traditions passed down through the generations verbally and not transcribed until some three or four hundred years after the Viking era, like the 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries. You know, that's some three to five hundred years of the telephone game. You know, who knows, you know, how drastically different those stories could be, how far they veer from their true origin. Maybe these Icelandic sagas were created out of whole cloth some 500 years after the fact. Who knows? Maybe much later than that, as I suspect. But one thing I've noticed is that I cannot find a good description of what Vikings looked like. Most of the descriptions give them place names or family names, right? Other than names like Eric the Red, and that didn't necessarily have to have anything to do with his hair. There's no, I can't find anything that says yellow haired giant, you know, or anything like that in any of the descriptions that I've read so far. At least not yet, anyway. Not even in my Dawn of European Civilization coffee table book can I find any reference to what they look like and whose chapter on the Vikings is called From the Vigorous North. And, of course, it's chapter 11, right? Because the Vikings are the gateway to this. This is really unbelievable. And so I read this whole chapter, right? And there wasn't one account of what they physically look like, you know, or where the first Vikings came from. And so I'm going to close this one out here and pick it up with what the narrative tells us about where the first Vikings came from and how this could relate to the cancellation of Sterla in the next Village Stomping episode. <laughs> so remember, guys, just because you don't know the truth doesn't mean you can't have fun with the lies. Cheers.